I'm going to continue this episode where I left off in the last one. In the last days of the war in Czechoslovakia. We're going to visit the SS Pioneer School in Haidishko and take a look at what Emil Klein was doing there as well as Rolf Engel in those last days of the war and cover some of the top secret missions that has taken place since in that very area. And with that, we have to start of the story of the SS Pioneer School in Haidishko. It was established as the first military school in the SS training area of Beneshov. The training grounds was called the SS Trubeobungsplatz Beneshov and later renamed as Trubeobungsplatz Bohemian. The school was established in 1942 and the commander of the school was a veteran of the Russian campaign and World War I, SS Obersturmbannführer Emil Klein, born in 1898. He joined the SS in 1935 and already 1938 he was the commander of Pioneer Sturmbahn 1. From 1940 he was the commander of Pioneer Schutzbataillon 1 from the 1st of July 1942 to the 1st of March 1945. He was also the commander of the SS Pioneer School in Haidishko. And yes, I'm aware that I'm pronouncing the city's name wrong. We're just gonna have to go with that. He was also enrolled in the Lebensborn program and during the First World War 1914 already, he won the Iron Cross second class. SS Oberführer Klein was captured at the end of the war and in December 1946 he was extradited by the Americans to Czechoslovakia. Do make note of the date 1946. Here he was then sentenced in 1947 by a special court to 12 years in prison. After protesting against this verdict, his sentence was increased to 20 years. From then on, he spent his life in a prison in Prague until December 1964, when he was finally released. And it's a story that did not even end with his imprisonment. It is also clear by all accounts and photos that he was tortured and interrogated over long periods of time, and by accounts a fellow German was inserted into the prison to befriend him in order to obtain the information they thought he had and would not divulge during torture. The SS Heidischko Pioneers Weapon School was created in the following structure. There was a school headquarters with staff, administration, there was a driving school, training schools for Leokobe 1 to 4, engineer school, regiment engineers, construction battalion, just like any other weapons training school. It must be said that there was a lot of SS training units in Czechoslovakia in general. Another important note that should be mentioned here is that Krosh, he was one of the key officers heading the SS construction units in Czechoslovakia. And he was one of the close contacts with General Kamla. And also after the war he mysteriously disappeared as well, leaving behind several unverified accounts of his death, murder or suicide. Don't know if you're sensing a trend here. Maybe he needs to be looked at closer. Also, the last known communication from General Kamla was to the SS staff at the Richard Mine site. By some accounts, he was expected to show up here, but never did. I still do have some reason to believe he was not going there at all. However, the Richard Mine now brings into light it might be more important, and there may be something to the stories that large amounts of something was being driven with trucks into the deep parts of the mine where after key points of access was destroyed. They are still inaccessible today. Initially, the Pioneer Company numbered about 200 men, non-commissioned officers and about 250 students. There was accommodations for some 60 horses, 200 vehicles and 400 soldiers were to be constructed, along with all of the various support buildings needed in order to run such an operation. All unused buildings in the areas were allocated for accommodation were to be adopted for the school staff, and most of the civilians were evicted from others. In the village of Hostishko, all buildings on the southern bank of the river up to the next village had to be adopted to accommodate the engineer battalion. Other construction was also done in the area. Some, it appears, that we are not entirely certain of what it was they were building here or constructing. 
There is some evidence that General Kamla had issued special constructions to Klein for something to be built here, despite the fact that he had no reason to issue such orders to any combat units. However, it is claimed that special research was done in the area, and it had begun at this time. Naturally, constructing weapons near a proving grounds does make sense, and it seems to be the same as what we have seen in Jonasthal, Germany. And there's also the large hydroelectric dam right here. The construction had initially been stopped from the dam in 1938. However, by 1942, it was reactivated with high priority. The fortunes of war was slowly turning against the Germans. Certainly one would think that spending resources on a dam in the middle of nowhere Czechoslovakia does not make much sense, but we have heard of hydroelectric dams before and around this same time. More interestingly is nobody seems to be able to determine exactly where the electricity from the turbines actually went. In 1945, orders were issued concerning the special training and preparation, concerning methods of security and destruction of individual types of bridges, whether it be wooden, iron, or concrete, methods of detonation of various types of charges, equipment tests, and new methods of fighting and the use of flamethrowers and other equipment of combat. However, the use of various engineering machines and tools and for the storing of various types of mines, S-mines, T-mines, R-mines, guidelines for clearing minefields and overcoming water obstacles were also issued. There was also a combat unit training with small boats in the very area. It is interesting that as the Russians were approaching, the end did seem in sight. Yet Klein's daily order of April 24, 1945, was concerning, for example, the transfer of troops between units, the assignment of new non-commissioned officers, the duties of two female auxiliary staff, instruction for bicycle maintenance, instruction for changing the postal service in the SS Bernishov training grounds, publishing the financial amounts collected from the various parts of the school as a financial gift to the German Red Cross, and publishing the search for missing persons. It seems trivial, yet an army does travel on its paperwork. But then it gets even more surreal. Klein's special order of April 30th, 1945, the day of Hitler's suicide in Berlin, this order was concerning the theft of a bicycle and the subsequent inspection of all other bicycles. Further instructions in the order concerns the introduction of markings, including the use of certain colors of bicycles, depending on the type of the unit that was using these. Now, either Klein was the coolest cucumber that ever wore a uniform, or he and his men were in complete denial as to what was happening around them. But I'm not sure either is actually the case. On the 5th and 6th of May, 1945, battle orders went out for Kampfgruppe Klein. This order was issued on May 4, 1945, at 2300 hours. Patton's forces had at this point crossed the Czech border. And Czech partisans had planned, but were not yet scheduled, to take to the streets in their armed revolt. But they were not doing this until the 6th. So clearly, Klein had some indication this was coming. Schröner's forces were still just holding the Russians east of Prague. The order set out combat tasks for individual parts of the six battle groups preparing for the Prague uprising. So, yet again, they must have known this was coming. Setting up and preparing for combat positions, the anticipated enemy route of approach. This involved complete units supplied by artillery, tanks, and assault guns. These were no small groups of just armed soldiers. These were well-equipped battle groups. The Czech partisans at this point was numbering about 7,500, and the Germans and the SS had tens of thousands of forces in the area, but were expecting small episodes of sabotage, and this indeed happened. It was key to secure the rivers and bridges, and preparing to blow others. The German forces wanted to keep the bridges across the river Vltava open to allow Schröner's army 
to go west into American captivity. Finally, the order came to break camp, and it states that the unit should move quickly to the area of the Bohemian Forest. The order stipulates that order of marching units, the vanguard, main column, and rear guard, the march routes with Hagedishko, Strasovitsa, Schlappi, Doris, Prepram, Strachic, and Senderuda. This is Klein's route out of Czechoslovakia, with whatever he and his men could carry. And this is interesting, because they are making a beeline straight towards Linz, where the Bergkristall tunnel system is, although at this time now in American hands. Although if they knew this at that time, I do not know. But it does seem that all roads led to Austria. On the ground, I'm going to take a look at the route that Klein and his men took away from here, and I found plenty of places there where certainly hiding places could easily be set up. The key points of the marching order was that all forces must get back to Germany. The Empire, as it was noted, is currently in a difficult situation, and they were to move quickly and uniformly as possible, absolute discipline in carrying out all orders and the orders of individual commanders failure to obey orders would result in immediate expulsion from the marching community. The order stated, and I quote, in these difficult times, we must be aware that all Germans will survive this march in every situation. The best defense of any individual lies in support and close connections with his unit. At the end of this document is the proclamation, the fate of the individual is the fate of all. Certainly, Klein had learned something from the evacuations out of Russia and all the partisans he had encountered there. Some units succeeded, but part of this battle group was forced to join the last battle of World War II near the town of Pribram, in the town of Milin, with the settlement of Slavice. And yes, I know I'm pronouncing it wrong, I am sorry. On the other side, the convoy of the U.S. Army reconnaissance vehicles, which crossed the agreed demarcation line, had moved in the area of Prebram in order to take German groups into captivity and to help local populations before the arrival of the Red Army. American troops tried to direct the retreating German troops and transport German columns to Hordice, where the prisoners of war camp was located. But numerically strong and very well armed remnants of the German army under command of Schröner and a lot of SS units under the command of SS Gruppenführer Karl von Pucke, commander of the Waffen SS in Bohemia and Moravia, these were determined to not surrender to the Russians. They were intermixed with large groups of German civilians and Czech collaborators trying to escape as well. This led to a lot of fierce fighting by several battle groups fighting that lasted until several days after the official surrender. Many of the SS men who managed to surrender to the U.S. Army were still handed over to the Russians, where most of them did not survive. There was now 25 to 30,000 soldiers and more civilians in the camp. However, here they could only remain for one night before having to move on to the west. Speed seemed imperative for everybody, both the Germans and the Americans, and chaos reigned everywhere. But this all seemed pretty straightforward, right? I mean, how does this turn into a treasure hunt for something lasting until this very day? And where does Kamla and Ingel fit into this mayhem? Now, by an interesting coincidence, the testimony of the German rocket engineer Jan Meyer have been preserved in the Prague archives. During the war, he worked for Engel. He was developing an acoustic rocket, and in April 1945, he was ordered to hand over these drawings to Rolf Engel, which he did. Maya made this statement in 1946 because he believed that his documents had been found by the Americans as part of their secret mission in 1946 in order to retrieve what was then believed to be the Kamla's papers. But more on that in a moment. However, we know that neither those papers nor Kamla's were to be found in the checklist of documents from this mission nor in the American one. 
So either these, along with other specialty documents, are still missing and can be found, or they were found in the U.S. Special Mission, or they were part of another special mission involving the Czech military in 89. Now, without speculations, or guesswork, or myths, there are three scenarios that are the most likely, and two events that are involved here of things that actually happened. So what do we know and what does this mean? Meyer handed over his secret plans to Wolf Engel in Hoadishko near the Pioneer School. And then Engel made his way out to surrender to the Allies. So this means that Rolf Engel was actively consolidating his secret research, that from his staff, and he was planning to either hide it or evacuate it with him. Now it does make sense that civilian scientists or even SS scientists would join up with the battle groups and fight their way out through the Allied lines. However, they would know that they were then going to have to surrender and surrender what they had brought with them. So maybe Engel needed the help of Klein to hide these documents in order to get a better deal for both of them. It is a possibility. But there is no shortage of inspiring stories from this area and this time in these events. We hear of gold trains entering the area for Berlin, although the train link with Berlin had at this point been severed. We hear planes with crates that are flown in from Berlin and Czech collaborators hiding bags of gold, all the way up to the suggestion that Goering's treasures were hidden here also. And we know that a very violent and venomous treasure hunt have been taking place here for the last 50-60 years. One of them led by the prisoner who shared a cell with Emil Klein before he's released. And the claim that he finally broke under torture and shared the hiding location of what he had hidden. At the suggestion he had to share it with the man that he was imprisoned with, and this man is now today a millionaire here in America, a businessman, who now also have an exclusive deal to be allowed to excavate the area with the Czech government. But honestly, I have not seen any credible evidence of any of that, and I'm not going to go treasure hunting anytime soon. But what I do know, and what I will try to do, is separate the gossip, and I'll actually tell you guys what happened here. This where the SS Pioneer School was during the war, the one that was run by Emil Klein. Emil Klein was in the SS, he was ranking, and he was the one that everybody thought that Hans Kammler has directed to bury his secrets, his information, his documents after the war. And after the war was over, Emil Klein spent 17 years in prison here in Czechoslovakia and they tortured him horribly for years and years and years to tell exactly where it was he had hidden Kamla's treasures, had he even known where they were. The Štěchovice, so-called Štěchovice treasure, is, it was uh, one really interesting uh, um, case uh, because the French intelligence officer uh, sent to Prague somewhere in 1945 message uh, that uh, the French army uh, captured a uh, former member of SS who gave the testimony that on the territory uh, uh, former in the time, former SS Truppen Ibungsplatz uh, Bemen nearby Třešovice, Štěchovice, that there is hidden the secret treasures. Nobody, in fact, didn't know what is in the cases. But in fact, nobody knows uh, what uh, is in these crates. And Czechoslovak intelligence uh, didn't believe, and so in their eyes, this message was unimportant. But when U.S. intelligence officers knew about it, and that uh, Czechoslovak side has had no interest, he secretly, uh, secretly uh, sent their uh, small troop, which. 
The very first secret mission of the beginning of the Cold War was one especially to raid one of the secret hiding places created by Klein, and supposed to hide secret research papers amongst other things. And it was just down the road from the Pioneer School. This was in 1946, and do remember that year. On May 22, 1946, Karl Hermann Frank was hanged in Prague, Czechoslovakia, for war crimes during the Second World War, he had been the de facto leader of the occupying forces of the provinces of Bohemia and Moravia. Although the American press did report on Frank's trial and execution, they did not reveal that the key evidence used to convict him had come from a top-secret military intelligence gathering mission to Czechoslovakia. It was codenamed Hidden Documents. Yes, they actually did call it that. It had been organized by the U.S. authorities and the G2 in occupied Germany. Now, the search for documents was not limited to Germany or Austria. Based on reports from the American embassy in Prague, the State Department believed that during the war, Germans had sent documents to Czechoslovakia for safekeeping at up to 50 different locations. In November 1945, Sergeant Gunther Achenbach, a POW in France, told his captors that he had been an instructor at the SS Engineering School near Strasovice. In April 1945, he had helped dig in a cave in the side of a ravine several miles outside town. The cave was supposed to be about 30 feet deep, 6 feet high, and 5.5 and feet wide. It was lined with wooden boards and had been extensively booby-trapped with explosives. Now, he had not been there when the cave had been filled up, but another SS non-commissioned officer had told him that two trucks had taken documents there. Achenbach said he helped camouflage the cave with dirt and vegetation, so after it was closed, nobody could tell there had ever been any digging going on there. He offered to go back and point out the site. Now the French relayed Achenbach's stories to the Americans, who thought it sounded promising. In December 1945, the G2, without revealing why, requested an air attaché in Prague get aerial photographs of the area around the cave. Achenbach was taken to Germany for detailed interrogation, and the G2 next requested that the military attaché in Prague arrange for a group of 14 American military personnel to enter the country. The State Department was not informed by the G2. The man put in charge of the mission was Lieutenant Colonel M. Spiegel, chief of the G2 Document Control Section. He assembled a team of 13 men, Lieutenant William J. Owen, intelligence officer, and First Lieutenant Leo Selbauer was the French liaison officer to the Document Control Section. Also, SS Sergeant Achenbach had to go and help locate the cave and would have a French guard. Of course, given the booby traps, a full-equipped bomb squad was also in tow under the command of Captain Stephen Richards from the 123rd Bomb Disposal Squad had been under Patton's 3rd Army. February 10, 1946, the team went through the border checkpoints using passes from the Czechoslovak Liaison Office in Regensburg. The group traveled in five vehicles, a command and a reconnaissance car, two two-and-a-half-ton trucks, and a weapons carrier and an air compressor trucks used by combat engineers. Achenbach guided the teams to the woods outside Teshovice. Without too much difficulty, he found the cave, camouflaged the locations, and now the bomb squad started probing for mines. After the top of the cave had been exposed, the explosive experts had to work slowly. Achenbach did not have the wiring diagram, and with a combination of experience and a bit of luck, Richards removed the only board of the entrance that was not attached to a detonator wire. Then he reached inside the cave and cut all the connecting wires he could see. February 12th, it was revealed that 32 wooden crates were inside the cave. As each one of them was taken out, Richards, Fulton, and Urquhart checked for booby traps around the remaining crates. About one ton of explosives and associated materials were removed. The SS had intended that if anybody break in trying to remove the entrance wall, it would set off teller mines, which would then explode containers of dynamite and then ignite cans of flammable oil. Thus, in the process, the intruder would be killed instantly and the fire would then start, 
burning out the rest of the cave's content. They were serious about hiding this. Moving the crates up the steep slope from the ravine to the trucks was hard work, and I wonder myself why did they not just park on the road below where I was walking later. Anyway, each one was about four feet long, three feet wide, two feet high, and weighed about 400 pounds. Somebody please run me the numbers of paperwork for those dimensions. Then suddenly, three Czech civilians appeared. They were all very curious about the activity, and with a language problem that did hamper communication, but clearly seeing what the Americans were doing, they pitched in and helped. They were rewarded with cans of corn, boxes of cereal, and packs of cigarettes, as was customary at that time. Earlier, Czech soldiers had also approached the area. Richards had gone out to give them cigarettes, and told them that they were digging for graves of American soldiers. They were satisfied with this explanation, but of course the team now did not know whether either of the two meetings had been or would be reported to superior officials, so the clock was ticking. The trucks were now loaded, the disarmed explosives and oil put back in the cave. To decrease the chance of being stopped by local authorities, the trucks with the documents had to leave for Germany immediately. The explosive team, however, they would stay in Prague, with the weapons carrier for two or three days to recover from their mental and physical ordeal, as it was stated, although making it all the way through World War II should probably have prepared them for one night's work. Anyway, they were to act as decoys, and they did indeed. The three explosive experts were picked up at their Prague hotel room and taken to the Czech General Staff headquarters for interrogation. It was not clear how the authorities had learned of the mission, but they were not happy. A Czech staff officer told Captain Johnson, assistant military attaché to the American embassy, that they would not be released until the crates were returned with an explanation given. Within several days, officials in the War State Department met in Washington to discuss the new problem. The State Department thought they could keep the documents and have their men released, and to avoid publicly, the American ambassador, Lawrence S. Steinhardt, apologized, and a member to the Czech Republic. And now the bells started ringing in Washington. Um, officials met at the war in the State Department to discuss their new problem. The State Department thought they could keep the documents and have their men released, and avoid publicity if American ambassador Lawrence A. Steinhardt apologized and a member of the Czechoslovak intelligence service was invited to examine the seized material. They were wrong. A preliminary analysis claims to have determined that the crates included archives of the German occupation office of Bohemia and Moravia from 1940 to 1945. Gestapo and SS security files were also there from the provinces, pre-war official and personal files of President Edouard Benesch, and an inventory of treasures in Bohemia's castles. But the Czechs were not amused, and it turned into a diplomatic back and forth, resulting in cases were returned along with a public apology. Now, if I one day do the movie of this, we can go into the details as to who wrote what angry letter and yelled at who won what phone. Now, after the crate from Stresovica was returned to Benish office, they were opened in the presence of representatives of all political parties and the Ministry of Interior. Also present was Yaroslav Drabjak, chief prosecutor for war crimes trials in Czechoslovakia, who combed through the contents looking for useful material, it was said. In late March 1946, the trial then of Karl Hermann Frank began, a number of witnesses to Frank's crimes over the years were available to testify, but at the trials, major war criminals at Nuremberg showed fixing responsibility for the kind of crimes were much easier if documentary evidence could be introduced to corroborate eyewitness testimony. No comment on that. Numerous documents unearthed from the cave outside Stresovica were introduced during Frank's trial as evidence against him. The crates are now on display along with the documents we are told were in them. However, given the time that had passed from the recovery until their return, there was ample time for the G2 to exchange or remove anything in them. 
Anyway, that is the official version of this mission. We can break that down a lot more between ourselves in the next chat. Although, of course, they only had a relatively small contingent of forced laborers to build for them here. So I'm not expecting any large constructions whatsoever. But they had enough to build things in underground, little hideaways. Oh, it truly is beautiful out here. And I could understand why people would want to spend their summers looking for something here. But I could certainly also see why it would be impossible for anybody to find something that had been deliberately hidden. There's not much here left to see. There might be something underground. Now, this is the very crude, rudimentary little cave slash bunker with wooden paneling, wherein they hid 30 crates of supposed very important documents. So important that the Americans risked what could have been an early beginning of the Cold War to come here and dig it out. Now, when I'm standing here and I'm looking around, I understand the war is coming to an end. You're in trouble. You need to hide things here, there, and everywhere. We're in the middle of the woods. Probably there was a dirt road here. Maybe, maybe not at that time. But to risk some of the most important documents of the entire war in a small, shallow cave here, booby-trapped or not, makes me wonder. Last-minute ditch effort to hide things before the war came to an end? Absolutely possible. Pre-planned location that Klein could have arranged for quite a while in advance. Both Klein and Kamla, they were smart people, and they knew the war was coming to an end. And they knew this months in advance. Klein could have used his forced labor to build a proper underground bunker where he could have hid some of the secrets, like what we've been told is on Mednik Hill. And Klein built plenty of ammunition bunkers here in the SS training area. Was it really that important what was found here? Papers of Collaborators, art, lists, entirely possible. Could have come from the Prague archives, possible. Could also just have burnt those. I would like to see the official American manifest of what was recovered in the 30 crates that was found here, heavily booby-trapped. I can't quite make up my mind as to what to think about this. This could easily have been a recent road. They put up a little memorial path where you can walk through the campsite, some of the sites where things happened, the bunkers, and then past here. So of course a little path would eventually have formed that would not have been here at the time. But. If you're going to hide something here, you didn't plan for it. You just found it in the last couple of days or weeks of the war where you can stick it and booby trap it. There's something more to this. And this is not where it's going to be found.
And of course, there's more. Because if they found one thing here, people have dug up holes in the ground here ever since, looking for more. So of course there are more holes. Treasure hunters have been going through this area for decades, even during the time of the Cold War. People were crawling around looking here. This is just such a strange place to hide important documents. You're in a crevice in a ravine by a spring that could very easily be flooded. If you have papers in wooden boxes, as we've seen photos of, that could very easily have whatever content destroyed. This must have been a last minute resort hiding place and they had time to hide and plan things it was really some uh, diplomatic disputes between us and czechoslovakia and uh, as we know the documents from these crates were shipped and given back to the czechoslovak side if everything nobody knows but they, these are really uh, precious documents which are now preserved in uh, Czech National Archive. What are the documents? The most of the documents were uh, from the so-called German um, State Ministry in Protectorate uh, Bohemia and Moravia. So it was such an uh, unofficial uh, Nazi government of occupied Czechoslovakia or occupied Bohemia and Moravia and uh, it was uh, really a lot of uh, crates there that was some the personal documents for example uh, from uh, deputy uh, protector and state minister Karl Hermann Frank and so on. It's uh, really very interesting uh, for the understanding of uh, German uh, policy during the occupation in the Bohemia and Moravia, uh, but uh, there is uh, nothing about some rocketry. Now, of course, this is the official statement of the events, and I would find it almost certain that to take such a risk for any documents that were not of critical importance seemed rather unlikely. And if these crates did not contain Engels' papers or those of the Kamlastak, then where did they go? This leads us back to Klein. Shortly after the war crimes trials had begun in Czechoslovakia, he was returned to stand trial and sentenced to prison. Now there's no shortage of documents and drawings that he did in prison, and on several occasions after being tortured, he took the authorities out to various locations in the area where they sought underground hiding places and bunkers he was said to have constructed. It is not clear to me, or indeed anybody, what they may have found or what they even sought. And since they kept him in prison for so long, there must have been a reason. Klein wrote an extensive diary while in prison, and he wrote it in code. It contains a lot of drawings, and it seems to be a simple code, but I cannot decode it, because that's not what I do. And it was claimed that Klein finally was released when he finally gave up the last hiding places. Of course, this happening behind the Iron Curtain, no one has any of this information. Klein died in Germany in early 1970s, but his cellmate, 
have been looking for his treasure ever since. In a report from the American Embassy in Prague to Washington on November 20, 1946, the military attaché informs of a program of secret weapons development in Czechoslovakia by the Germans. He also informs that Soviet troops have taken away a V-4 missile from the city of Bredyshov. Here, there is a local factory that has been working in cooperation with the Skodewerke in Dechen Putmolk. In addition, the American archives took the testimony of one of the workers from this factory. This witness also completed drawings of the secret weapons, stating that these documents and missiles eventually ended up in the Soviet Union. And according to the findings of historian Andreas Sulze, the main development of new weapons were transferred in the last months of the war from Germany and Poland to the Czech Republic and Austria near the Gusen and Linz area were back to where the Bergkristall tunnels are. In a U.S. Air Force intelligence report from December 1949, in a description of the V-7 program, according to this report, it was a long-range missile a combination of all known technologies, and when interrogated, General Berger even stated that the two missiles had been assembled. Due to their transport to the launch site, the low bridge over the motorway from Salzburg to Munich had been demolished. The interrogation center of the 7th U.S. Army informs on May 17, 1945, that only one functional control beam transmitter for remote-controlled missiles was located here in Pribram. This facility was in a triangular building on a hill slope. For the pioneer camp, there was also a labor camp set up, and some work was conducted in a rail tunnel that had been appropriated for wartime production of something we do not yet know what was. The labor camp was first filled with men who had fled their workplace or people accused of sabotage. In 1943, however, this camp was to be transformed into more of a classic concentration camp, which housed Serbs, Russians, Dutch, and French members, and people from other nations. This camp was a branch of the main concentration camp of Flossenburg. Prisoners from this camp worked in the nearby quarry originally, and on preparation of roads in the area and construction of anti-tank ditches near the village of Tripchen, also ammunition bunkers were constructed. There were no Jews in this camp, and interestingly enough, there was a large rail tunnel nearby that was taken over and sealed for the use as a factory. But according to local historians, there were no forced laborers working in this location. This may be a tell as to what was being made here, but yet I have no more information on this site. About ten days before the end of the war, the camp was evacuated west and through this road march, prisoners were sporadically executed. Now this could be for several reasons, other than just simple wartime excesses and cruelty. The shooting of marching prisoners on the road from a camp and this journey we might find interesting, and I will explore it. Because if these prisoners had been used to bury or hide anything, it would make sense to having to shoot them in order to eliminate any witnesses. However, this would only be the case with unplanned last-minute hiding of assets, and as Klein as the SS construction staff had plenty of time to construct underground bunkers for hiding things. However, according to the prisoners who were there, during those last days, a lot of SS men arrived at the camp. They were all extremely heavily armed and seemed very nervous. This does, of course, fit well into the situation they were currently in. This might also be a count reason for the excess shootings. However, it will be said that most prisoners from this camp actually survived, thus the testimony.
Back way before World War II, this was an old monastery. But eventually during the war, first the army and then the SS moved in and took over the entire area. Few of the inhabitants were allowed to stay and run farms. But this was Emil Klein's area. But given that the whole area was taken over by the SS for the pioneer school, it would be strange if not all of this had been occupied. That leads us down a rabbit hole where a lot of other treasure hunters have gone over the past many decades of having dug up every single bit of rock and tunnel they could find here at Haladishko and at Stasovice. And they did find something, because as the Cold War ended, a very large entity came back. Byla to malá zemědělská vesnice. It was a small agriculture village here. And at the end of the 19th or at the beginning of the 20th century, the railway was built up to here. A odstartovala vlnu turismu. And um, like a, the tourists from Prague started to come with the railway. This was like a holiday area. Yes, because it's beautiful and it's close. A v roce 1942 Kromě toho, že byla válka a dělo se tady se for the tak. war all around, but nothing special. Here. So 1942, what happened? Um, so in June 1942, the people learned that they are supposed to move out by September from their homes. And the local agricultures, they they were uh, allowed to har harvest, stay, harvest, stay and harvest, and then leave. Přišli důstojníci, velitelé a začali dávat rozkazy o tom, co se tady musí vybudovat a připravit pro příchod stovek vojáků. Officers came first and started to give orders what has to be built and done and prepared for accommodation for 200 uh, 200 soldiers was to be established in Vikovice. Dalších 200 300 vojáků na Brunčově. Other 200 in Brunčov. Because Hradiško is divided into three or four like smaller parts, yeah, so Brunčov is on the way to Štěchovice. Postavili se tady dřevěné ubytovny pro vojáky. Wooden barracks for the soldiers were built or kasárnas were built. Potom se tady postavila velká jídelna pro vojáky. A dining room for the soldiers yes. was built. Hmm? Who, who built everything? Kdo to postavil? Už ty vězni? No, stavili to podle mě české stavební firmy. At the beginning there were Czech uh, uh, building companies, because someone had to know how to do it, I think. It was. A potom uh, právě žádali, že chtějí tady mít levnou pracovní sílu, protože to bylo nákladný. And then they decided because it's too, too, too expensive, so they asked so, uh, for the prisoners, like the, the officers asked. This was always SS, so the SS would yes. eventually call on the slave laborers to yes. come build for them. That's what they did. Yeah. How did that start? Za prvý byli pod tlakem, že to mají tady zřídit dost rychle. Už od září nebo už vlastně v tom červnu se tady začalo budovat. A kde tady měli být ti vojáci? To nevím přesně. They were under pressure. They were. It was supposed to be really quickly. Here, ready. So they already started in June, and after one year, it was rebuilt and pro pro vězni a různých národnost enlarged for prisoners from other countries. What was the conditions at the camp? Jak to vypadalo? Tábor tvořili dvě dlouhé dřevěné budovy. The camp was. Of two long wooden buildings, 
kuchyň, marotka. So there was a medical doctor attached. Probably some doctor. So it was very basic. So what was the prisoners made to do here? Stavěli silnici. They built the road or roads here. A stavěli střelnici na medníku. And they built the střelnice, shooting range or what is it called? Pistol šíst štand. The prisoners worked at the railway station in Měchenice and they were disembarking trains and transporting some material to the closed railway tunnels where some factory were built, some factories. But the prisoners didn't work inside them. No. So that was just German war production. Probably. And they built some bunkers around for ammunition for the training. Taky o tom nic nevím. So we don't know. Build the bunker. And one of the local local men remembers working during the war with the prisoners at the construction site in the woods, and he was a mason. He was a mason, so that's why he lived there. Věznům nechával schované jídlo, protože měli hlad. They were helping the prisoners with some food. They were hiding the food in the forest for them. A před koncem války pracoval ještě s jinými Čechy v Rokli, kde byl ukryt štěchovický archiv. And before the end of the war, he worked together with some more Czechs and some more prisoners at the site where then the Štěchovice archive was found. But he didn't come back to that. No, no, he they fled because they were guarded with the Germans with the rifles, guns, and they were afraid that they would. They would be shot next day, so they didn't return to that construction site, and they fled to form a resistance resistance unit. How many of the prisoners here died? What did they lose? Zemřelo vězni? Tak zhruba asi 150. Around 100. And how many of them died from work or? Umírali. Průběžně, jak to říct, umírali hlady pod výživou a protože v táboře byly hrozné hygienické podmínky, tak na infekce. They were continuously dying on of malnutrition and some illness, sicknesses because the hygienic situation in the camp wasn't good. A 9., 10. a 11. dubna byli hromadně stříleni. Decades of strange people coming here, digging in the ground and in the hills for something. How did that start? Po válce to bylo až až v šedesátých letech. To souviselo s výslechy. To, to souviselo s výslechy Emila Kleina a nevíme o ničem. This I did not expect to see. I thought I was going to look at an ammunition bunker. This is two defensive firing positions in a fairly large bunker that's been left behind. This looks more like a defensive position, a Reiklebau. But this is large. Is. This is a lot larger than I would think for an ammunition bunker. 
What is an ammunition bunker? Like bunker where you... You store ammunition. I don't know. Well, but the, you have two firing ports here. I don't. You, this is, you have a, literally a defensive position. Yeah, that's what I thought always it was, rather than... Uh, but I, I, I mean, I this looks like it could have been blown up. Somewhat demolished because there wouldn't have been a groove there. I don't know what this is. What is this? In here were the two barracks, A and B, where 500 prisoners were living. Barely a few foundations of the two barrack buildings that was here. Camp was erected in 1942 because the SS training camp needed workers to build infrastructure and everything else that was needed. And today it's inhabited by sheep. Today you see practically nothing left of the two barracks of all the prisoners and this small camp. That was to help build and work on whatever the SS needed for their training school area. Obviously, there's an information gap because of the secrecy behind the Iron Curtain. But what is known is that in 1989, another secret mission to that area took place and right again in the middle of Klein's area, and I wanted to see this for myself. This is where it gets interesting. I am now on Metnik Hill, Metnik Hill North. This is where a very organized and expensive expedition took place right after the Cold War ended, where three international conglomerates went together and dug something up. Later, a 20 by 20 circular hole was found up here. It was been filled by cement after whatever was found was found. It was very likely this was connected to Emil Klein and to Hans Kamla and what he had possibly hidden. Now, what I've never seen in all the years I've excavated bunkers and fortifications is an underground circular hole. Well, I have to start looking for infrastructure that would be capable of carrying cement trucks since they filled it up with tons and tons and tons of cement. But up the hill I go. This road would certainly be capable of carrying trucks. And what I'm, what I'm looking for is signs of an underground bunker, signs of construction some 30, 40 years ago. But this is all within the SS Bergebiet, or within the training area, so it's entirely possible that Emil Klein and his people from the SS Pioneer School had plenty of time to hide things here. Not only that, at several locations, Prisoners from the camp that had been forced to work here were executed, some for no seemingly reason, except for the fact that they might have been working on something that the SS wanted to keep secret. Now certainly structures and here canals for water has been built leading water off the mountain. And like I said, for decades, treasure hunters have been looking here. So there will be an enormous amount of holes in the ground, which is not gonna make this easy. Although whatever I'm seeing up here is certainly man-made. I'm not entirely sure what I'm actually looking at here. This could have been part of any number of things and it could have been built at any point in time in history. It looks like it could have been part of a road bridge. And with a little help of Captain Hindsight, 
and future knowledge, I can now tell you that this is actually part of the pistol range that the prisoners built for the SS to train on. But looking at it on the ground, it was really hard to say because I've seen a lot of pistol ranges. This was very elaborately built to hang up targets and had rails and all the usual stuff you'll see of a modern pistol and firing range today. Just wanted to share that and clarify that. Now Metnik Hill itself is in there and I'm on the north slope. I'm gonna circle it and see what I find and then I'm gonna crisscross it on top. I'm nearing the top of Metnik Hill over to here I start seeing signs of digging. It's a rock with a square curb to it or square edge to it. One of the bits of rocks. So I think I'm pretty much on the south side. Like I said people have been digging everywhere. So we'll see. Get to the top and then come down on the north. Nobody would hide anything on the top of the mountain, obviously. Well, this is the top of Mednik Hill, where everybody have dragged up all the rocks in a pile. And certainly, 417 meters is by far not the worst I've ever seen. Don't know what's in here. Phone number, brochure, note paper. Okay. So now we're on top of this infamous place. And from now, we're supposed to find the site of the excavation after the Cold War. Where do you start? The north side of Mednik Hill. At least I have a good view, but where do you start? It was not unusual to bury things at the root of a tree for identification. There's a tree that's fallen over. A lot of times we find things embedded in tree roots. Here, this tree, when it fell, they must, it must have grown on top of the mountainside because it took all of this stone with it. So I did a six sack grid search coming down the mountain side to side. One that I did not want to inflict you guys with because it would simply look like me walking through the woods. But when you see here on the side of a hill how everything has been dug up the ground has just been overturned and there's these little fenced in enclosures with a sign and check that I can't read. People have definitely been looking here. There's a hole in the ground down there. There's a hole in the ground everywhere. This whole place has just been uprooted. If this was the sum, I would say shell craters, but no. All right, so what really happened here on Mednik Hill? Well, there's no shortage of names, military units, governments, and companies claimed to have collaborated in 1989 in an effort to dig up what was initially claimed to be Goering's treasure. One of the former Field Marshal's family members appeared to also have been involved, as were several film production companies and a Japanese insurance company. 
and this information is cited by local historians who have been cited by other historians who have then been cited in books. It does not mean that it is not correct. It certainly does mean that there's no contemporary information to back it up that I have been able to find. So what I wanted to do is go to the site. I will give you a short breakdown of what we are told, however. Prior to 1989, a documentary film company discovered a site where Goering supposedly had hidden his art treasures. And still to this day, thousands of paintings and art pieces are still missing from the war, so that certainly is plausible. Then, the Czech military and government became involved in negotiations with the foreign company seeking permission to extract this treasure. A percentage split was negotiated and settled upon. Czech special forces would protect the excavation and airspace. The military would protect the perimeter. The Czech arms dealer Omnipol became involved, as there might be military secrets involved. The Japanese insurance company Fujama would supply technical equipment to pinpoint the location, and apparently JPL was rumored to have involvement as well. Remember, this is still when Russia had their hold over Eastern Europe, so apparently there was also rumors to have been at least three shootouts between what was expected to be KGB operatives and the soldiers guarding the perimeter. There has been a lot of very well-researched people that has come here and dug through here with more information than I have. The only information I really need to know is that they found something. They came back all the way after the Cold War to dig something up. Now, I don't know if it was Emil Klein that finally admitted and told his interrogators where things were. You would think if he had done, they would have dug it up back then. So this must be information that the other side of the Iron Curtain, the Americans, American intelligence, have gotten to during the Cold War, but could not get to dig up until the Cold War ended. So whatever they dug up here was so important, it was worth sitting, waiting 40 years to come back here with a huge excavation to dig it up and find it and then seal it and hide it. This looks like the battlefield of the Somme. This is full of holes. And I don't know if these are markers for the lumberjacks here who were, of course, cutting the trees and what have you. Don't really know what to make of this. But there is an arrow pointing this way, and that's, I guess, good enough for me. So, there's a two pointing to there. This is unbelievable. It looks like this place has been carpet bombed. If you have tangible information to, to go by, you dig that tangible information. You don't just saturate dig. Or do you? And why are these two holes, three holes, fenced in? What's so special about these three? And the ones over there? Below me here, underneath Metnik Hill, is a waterfall. And up here is the hillside everybody has been digging. Nice of them to put up a little table. What is interesting is you had here American millionaires, independent treasure hunters, People from all walks of life have been digging here for decades. And then as soon as the Cold War is over, like that, suddenly three large international companies with ties to military and intelligence comes in, digs something up, covers it up, and even today they don't even acknowledge that they were here. Obviously they were acting on 
better intel than all the civilians that was digging here. And it's not unusual for military contractors to be used by proxy by the military or intelligence to do things like this. So what did they find? Now I can't fly a drone in here, but when I say they dug up the entire hillside, I'm serious. They dug up every couple of yards on the entire hillside. Everything is just a big crater. Now, if you work in the public affairs office, I'm public affairs right now in the State Guard in California, if you work for JPL, or you work for Fujama, large Japanese insurance company, and some git like me calls and says, by the way, I found out you were involved in digging up some of the secrets of this old Nazi general who worked with rocket research and nuclear. What do you say? Okay, if you're a Czech arms dealer, you don't have to say anything. What do you say if you're in JPL or another government contractor, somebody asks you that? Not much you can say, really, can you? You want to admit to this? No, you just stay quiet. I, and I get that, I get that. It's just funny to think when somebody says that the business you work for was busy looking up an old Nazi general's rocket secrets from World War II. What do you say to the guy I ask? How do you push that question upwards to your boss? I get it taking them time to respond. Although J.P. Ellen, they, they did respond. JP all they did respond and very very nice public affairs officer had absolutely no idea what I was talking about and I believe her there'll be absolutely no reason why she would know this is not exactly what goes in an internal brief down to the public affairs office is it now I've walked around Metnick Hill still haven't found what I'm looking for I circled it That's a little improvised walk bridge. But this little gully here looks exactly like the one at Slezovice. You could hide anything anywhere here. Fortunately, in small communities, everybody knows something. And if you ask enough questions, well, you meet somebody who has an answer. This is where they came back to dig. Right, 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 right here. Yeah, right here. Right here. Well, there's absolutely, there's absolutely nothing here. Are there, are, there a, are there any signs of, of anything? Can any, somebody talked about uh, an entrance where there was a water drain. Nothing? But, uh, you know, probably here could be signs because he, here is grass. Yeah. This is... One of those. This is this is some other part of this. Probably. So this is where they went. Residue of cement, something. All right, so what do we have underneath us here? Něco, čeho se komunisti potřebovali zbavit před revolucí. It's hard to say whether there are 
to je fakt nějaká teorie. Whether there are some documents or something that the communists needed to get rid of at the end of the regime. <laughs> so they buried something here or did they find something here? Něco tam pohřbili nebo něco tady našli? Něco tu hledali a možná i něco ukryli. Ale ne komunisti, ne? Komunisti? To bylo ještě před revolucí. Yeah, so they were uh, uh, looking for something and they might have also hit something here. At, at the end of the Cold War, 89? Yeah, in 89. So there's a chamber underneath us. And they, they the, the excavated uh, uh, stuff was taken away. I think to pull back, so <laughs> that's why they have to do it with the concrete. No. They excavated the earth and then a lot of concrete it was poured, back, poured in. back in. That That's what I heard and that's what we have the survey, we have the, the, the ground penetrating radar of this room that's been filled up. Yeah, definitely. Well, and why, why would you fill something up if... Nobody knows. Who, who did it? Soldiers. Soldiers did it. And it was 89. Summer? Late? During the summer. Are there any photos or documents or witnesses? Fotky, dokumenty, světkové? Žádný. Počkat, co ten tvůj muž? Ten tvůj tady byl? No to je světek, svědek. svědek. <laughs> My husband. Your husband? Your husband? Witness. Your husband witnessed it? No, byl As tady jako dítě. Because his parents Přišel worked in the forest, so he was there with them. And then he somehow sneaked in into the end, so then, so he saw himself, the hole. It's What really interesting how that hole have turned into something completely different in the outside world. Uh, with and this was Russian soldiers or Czech, Czech soldiers? soldiers? Czech soldiers. I mean this is a this is a <laughs> cement dump. Yeah. Mr. Gensel yes. told her that he spoke to one of the one of the policemen or one of the men who were involved in this digging yeah. in 98 and he told him uh, that two of the soldiers digging here were inhaled some like something wrong down there and so they were taken to the hospital and then afterwards they finished with the excavation but I'm not was it a bad air, sense. poison, radiation, uh, not uh, some gas, some gas. And honestly, if I ever wanted to make a thriller spy movie, this would be it. Anyway, according to the information we have, 540 crates were recovered. They were uncovered from an underground bunker that was secured by a 12 meter thick concrete seal and covered by an additional five meters of soil. That is a significant thickness if this is true. There were documents on high explosives, development of an atomic bomb, and all documents were to be kept by the Czechs. Gold and gems were to be distributed according to 67% for the Czechoslovakians and 33% for the foreign partners. It was apparently a significant military mission Camouflaged by nets and tree heights, no flyover areas, civilians evacuated, barbed wire circling the area. There's no shortage of details as to this mission. However, something actually did happen, and something was actually excavated and dug up, and Klein had drawn up maps of bunkers that he supposedly had taken part of constructing during the war, although none of them seemed to match uh, what the GPR survey citing this area later, it told of a 90 meter long hallway and a circular room that these were found in. However, with all this talk, I managed to find a living witness who actually saw something happening at that time and day. And I will agree that something was there. Something was found, and something was extracted, and the site was covered up. Towards the end of the war, the final order was given by Emil Klein to his SS troops at the school. Stay together, because on one hand the Russians were advancing, on the other side the Americans were advancing, and you had the Prague uprising with Czech partisans taking shots at them from every side. 
They marched in columns through these roads and through the cities and made several stops on the way. The intention was to surrender to the Americans advancing from the west rather than the Soviets where they know certain death. However, even after surrendering to the Americans, many of the SS men were handed over to the Russians where many of them died and some, like Emil Klein, would not return for 17 years. In here is the ravine where all the documents were hidden that was recovered in 46 by the Americans. A little plaque has been put up to commemorate that. Still, even locals and many officials wonder if the Americans really returned all the documents. I smile a bit when I hear statements like that because of course they didn't. Come on, this is international politics. This is World War II secrets. This is spying at its best, infiltration. This is the Cold War lining up. It would almost have been wrong if they had. Towards the close of the war, many of the prisoners here had become nervous at the presence of a large amount of very heavily armed SS troops that also seemed rather nervous. And sporadic shootings of prisoners had begun to occur. Now granted, that's reason enough to be nervous, but you can understand the position of the SS troops at the end of the war. The Russians were closing in from one side, the Americans from the other, and there was an armed uprising at Prague that had started taking place. I was taking pot shots at German soldiers wherever. They even took over eventually the Skoda back in Pilsen, rolled out three Hetzers, started attacking the Germans with them. So you can understand why you'd be rather trigger happy, especially in the SS, where they knew nothing good was going their way. But also of interest if you notice that the prisoners were being shot somewhat systematically. These are the same prisoners that were been used to dig and build underground shelters, like the one back here in the ravine. So of course, given that logic, you start killing off the witnesses before you make your escape, or at least try to. This is a very interesting slab of cement. Mounts for probably antenna, weatherproofing on top. In the middle of the forest here. Now incidentally, down the line, down the river here, there is a dam. So there's power production around here, electricity. Down there's the hydroelectric plant with the pipes running up the mountain. And one of the new power poles and one of the old ones foundation. Just to note that significant amounts of electricity have been made here for quite a while. Well, and then I found a very large hole, very large hole that people know about because there's warning signs and fences. Unfortunately, the fence came down right there, so I have no idea what I'm looking at here. If this was the munition bunkers that were blown up, I don't know. Dead in, dead in craters. There's some brick rubble. And they are very deep too. I can see why you want to warn people not falling in here. I just don't know what in here is huh maybe it is an old mine it runs along here
interesting. Good place to hide things if it's an old mine. I wonder what an SS Pioneer Battalion would do in an area like this. It's a good place to train. I really don't know what this was. I'm on top of a hill. Clearly. Road down there. Here, water. I'm wondering if people have been digging here as well. Maybe people were digging here. I wonder why. Of course, this is not far from where the Americans found those crates. So, obviously everything else around would be dug up. But every once since. Natural, but since that groove doesn't continue, I'm curious now. And I will try to make my way down the mountain to see what road is there and where that will take me. Oh. This whole area is just full of gigantic holes. Like I said, the whole area has been dug up by Lord knows everybody. Hmm. Of course, stuff like this would need to be cleared for roads. That's something you would make prisoners do. No. And as I'm leaving Haradishko, I follow Klein and his men and their march route out of Czechoslovakia, which leads me pretty much straight down to Linz and Gusen, the Bergkristall tunnels, which was Kamla's first and largest jet production facility, where much other research also took place. And that is an area that is full of mystery and cover-ups in itself. On the way, there are so many interesting places and tunnels and caves where hiding places could have been found. They made camp here for a few days. And certainly there are signs of small bunkers and tunnels, tunnel entrances. This certainly does look like 1940s construction, cement. And then there's this tunnel here or the entrance to one. Could have been a munition storage. Could have been entrance to a deeper tunnel. But Klein, he knew he was going to be safe here, at least for a while. He knew he had SS infrastructure here. So what is in there Brick walled entrance, another one with a new steel door. And somebody post war put a window in there. So, how deep this goes? Certainly, you wouldn't hide anything in here. But, these two, certainly if he was an SS Pioneer camp, this would be a good place to store munitions. And the camp was on the hill, or beyond it, or in the buildings down here in the valley. Certainly, this is not a bad place to store munitions 
which means you could also safeguard other things, and you have infrastructure to build it. And here's another one. It looks like it's been decorated slightly ever since, since the other side of the war with the little cave out there. And the other one is right behind it. So there's th these three small bunkers or entrances here and one on top of the mountain. And I must say I'm very curious as to what is in here. Klein and his men were not looking for a place to defend, to make a stand. They were trying to get away. And much as you have great visibility of the surrounding neighborhood, the little town here, Russian artillery would have dispersed with anything on this hill if it had come to that. <clears throat> There's a little shrine here on top of the hill. I would like to have gotten into the tunnels. They're nicely padlocked off. And quite frankly, I have no idea who I would ask to let me in here. I'm certain there is a local historian. But again, and you have a dense woods, forests surrounding us here. And if we think of Stresovice and that, I'm going to call it an improvised wooden walled bunker dugout where they hid treasure so important that the Americans would actually come get it in 46, risking another Cold War. So obviously what they buried there, what the Americans found, those 32 crates were important. But they were buried in a hurry. It was not a bunker, it was not bomb proof, it was heavily, heavily booby trapped, but it was still just 32 crates sitting in an earth dugout with wood strengthened walls and a bunch of diesel, gasoline, flammables and explosives on top. It wouldn't take many days, maybe even hours to set that up. They would have the same amount of time during their road march out of Czechoslovakia. They could have done improvised duckouts, caches, anywhere along the route. We already heard in 1945 the Russians and the Americans were almost coming to a shootout and a handover of things in Gusen. So there was every potential and the road path towards the Cold War was absolutely established. So why would the Americans, in the middle of that environment, risk it all by sneaking into Russian-held territory, Czechoslovakia, to dig out 32 crates? But they did, and they found them, and I'm certain what they handed over when they returned them was not what they originally found. Of course, the question is then, what was so important they came back in the late 80s? Now, I am by no means finished with Czechoslovakia. There's a lot of sites to search here, a lot of research and a lot of bunkers and strange occurrences. And a lot to be found in the archives as well. For now, I'm going to follow Klein, Engel and Kamla, and we need to head to Austria and Linz. One interesting location I just want to take you to now that I am here, remembering that a lot of Czech workers were put on par with German workers, like at the Skodavaka, and here in Czechoslovakia there is an expertise in mining, including a mining university and school, and a lot of great mines. One of them have been turned into a museum. The SS did not utilize the mining skills of these people, but I thought it would be interesting for us, since I'm here, to visit these great people running it and see the technology from the day. We are in the Czech Republic in a town called Příbram, which is near Prague, about 65 kilometers on the southwest. And we are in the mining museum. <laughs> Am 
Mining cars that are very nicely restored. A historical miner, it was founded in medieval ages, uh, but uh, then it was uh, abandoned for the mining. And uh, another time uh, when it was uh, at work was uh, 19th century, it belonged to uh, the Austria Hungarian uh, monarchy and uh, they produced mostly silver and lead in, in here in these mines. This building is uh, from the 19th century and it belongs to a complex of mines here in uh, the region of Březové Hory, which is part of Příbram. And, uh, there were five of the main mines. Each of them reached the depth of 1,000 meters. So were they in use after the Second World War? Yes, they were. Uh, these mines were closed at 1978, but the production of uh, the lead, silver and other metals uh, was declining. And it was mostly because it, uh, it didn't make en enough profit. The technologies were too expensive to make enough profit. So it was decided by the government in year 1965 that these uh, mines will be closed. There was a huge protest against it, mainly uh, from the workers because it was the, it was the main uh, source of uh, living for the local people. So they managed to postpone uh, the closing to the year 1978. So you, now, you, you, when did it turn into a museum and how did, how did that happen? How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> uh, here in this town was previously another museum. It was founded in the year 1886. And uh, it didn't have the mines because they were functional at the time. But uh, after the mines were closed in 1978, uh, it was decided by the town uh, municipalities and uh, the mining directions that uh, they could let the buildings to, to the town to, to create the museum here. So they let us the, the buildings and some uh, equipation as you can see here, some machines and some technologies and I think that it was uh, started in the uh, early 80s when they uh, uh, changed it into the museum. And so you still have trips underground so people can come yes, visit? Yes, we have some underground expositions which unfortunately we can't visit today because of the restrictions connected to the Covid uh, disease. But uh, we have another uh, mines which are part of the museum. It's called uh, Wojtech and Anna, and they both uh, provide uh, the tours underground. Oh, and they're here in the, in the area as they well? They are nearby, about four, 400 meters from here, so by walk. All the things that they're sitting, these are all the implements from the mining. Yes, these are original instruments used by the miners in the mines. Some drilling machines. Uh, here you can see yeah. the cart which was used for, uh, for the ore or what is it called? The, the material they actually uh, took from, from the mines. Yeah. <laughs> So during the Second World War, the Germans were using the materials from the mine. Yes, they were. Was there forced laborers that was working here? or? Mm, I, I'm not really sure. I am not uh, such an expert on this part of uh, history. But they, I think uh, most of the men were in the army. Uh, and uh, those who were left worked here, I think, voluntarily because they were paid. They, they needed to supply and support their families. And uh, what I've read is that uh, there was some sort of uh, fight against the Germans, mostly done by damaging the technologies and the instruments they used for Resist work. Resistance work. Resistance, exactly. 
And there was a mining school here too. Yes, but during the Second World War it's closed by the Germans. When they annexed Czech, Czechoslovakia, they closed uh, the universities and the high schools, so the high school was closed during the Second World War. So how far down did this elevator go? Uh, 1,100 meters. This is the deep elevator for, for people or for material? For both. For both? Yes. They use these cages. For the, for the people? For the people and also for the material. They put the carts in there too. So we are standing uh, about a thousand meter hole in the ground? Yes. Oh good. Well that's not strange. I mean they really knew how to build back then. Considering that this is a, a mining construction building, it is so ornate and beautiful. It's very good looking. It is, it's a yes. very good looking building. Because it was not only the purpose of the building, but also uh, the, the look that uh, mattered for them. <laughs> that was actually a thing, they actually took that yes. in. You know what? This is an awesome museum. This is really, really cool place to go see because all the mining materials and what they used to mine and drill, well, it's exactly what we have been looking for and researching for all the other various locations that people have been, that we've been seeing how the Germans have been drilling underground. And here you have all the machinery to show how this was done. And it is beautifully restored. And this building is absolutely stunningly gorgeous. I don't even know what this thing is. Well, I have an idea what this is, but it probably should be on Transformers. What an interesting multi-drill. Kind of make me think I want one. I'll be absolutely honest with you, the mining museum here at Pribram is just awesome. Really cool bunch of people that's running it, that's working here. And also you have all this equipment, all this gear, all this authentic mining equipment from way back in the day that is totally restored. And you can get to take the train down underground, really get you a feel for what that was like. But as it is with most of the European towns, the buildings are beautiful. But seriously, going through small towns in Europe, like this one here at Pribom, where so much history took place for one, but also because the buildings are just beautiful. Not to mention, cobblestone streets are, well, it's not like great for your suspension, but it is pretty. And so are all the buildings and the architecture for these buildings, where most of them were built hundreds of years ago, when there really was a craft to not only did the buildings have to be functional, they also have to look good. For these episodes, I spent a lot of time going through archival footage and video and pictures. And for this one especially, I went through a lot of the original footage of the German and the SS surrender in Czechoslovakia, handing over to the Americans and original footage from the uh, uprisings and one piece of footage that really stuck with me is this Sturmbannführer. I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know if he's jesting or he's dressing down the poor USGI, but this is not a man that looks like he was beat. It does not look like a man who just lost a war uh, and Honestly, the GI he's talking to really looks like he's probably rather happy he didn't have to fight these guys. I don't know, just something about this guy, I would love to know more about him. And looking at them all, none of them seem to look like they just lost a war. Just food for thought. Behind me is Vanna von Baun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebner's nuclear reactor. Over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. 
I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow, and share what I'm doing trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that I use for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, uh, my PayPal is there, protectionserviceint.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.